it's so strange to start talking to people that I know that are Spanish speakers in English. <laughs> But here we are. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I, I would rather see people here. Whoever wants to put the camera on, that will be much better. Thank you. Hi, Carl. Hi, Vanina. Uh, hi, Marcin. Hi, Bartos, Luisa. Um, happy to be here. Um, I am trying to figure it out, figure out. Hi, Mikael. <laughs> Um, to hear it out how to give a format for this uh, that will work for the people and how we are. So um, first I want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Manuela. I'm a psycho clinical psychology from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, I am a trainee in ACT and mindfulness and in other stuff. And the things that I'm going to present today, uh, it's like a, a teaser of a small introduction. And if you wanna have more, maybe you can come to a workshop that I'm going to offer at the ACVS World Conference um, that it will be in Spanish. <laughs> so for the Spanish speaker one. So this is a very dear subject that I have been working and presenting at ACBS conference since 2011 uh, around embodied act metaphors and how can bodily experience may be a vehicle to contribute in the implementation of act. So, I have been working on this kind of development, developing uh, embodied metaphors to work inside the clinical setting for quite a long time. So what we are going to do today, um, it's that it's not going to be that much as a workshop, but more kind of a lecture with some exercises. It will depend on all of you. Um, what I will do first is an introduction on why including felt sense and body experiences in, in the clinical setting, that it may be kind of odd or strange or rare. <laughs> um, and if we can, we will experience together and share the experience of an embodied metaphor today and discuss a little bit the mechanism behind the metaphors and open to some questions around this kind of stuff. So the starting point is why, including body experiences uh, while working with ACT or in the clinical setting at all. And This has a personal journey issue behind that uh, I do have a chronic disease since I was 17 that was quite in, inhabilitating for me to do a lot of stuff for uh, a lot of time. Uh, so I started searching medical stuff and psychological stuff, but what did profoundly helped me was uh, contemplation practices as mindfulness. So I have been practicing mindfulness for a long time, but especially different kind of body awareness experiences and helping me work with what was happening and gain agency in a way of what was happening to me in my body. Um, well, by being more conscious and being more able of sensation, how emotions impacted in my body and how even thoughts impacted in my body. 
So if you think that what I'm going to present, it's about people with uh, um, disease that may affect the body, it's not. It's coming from there that made me more aware how body experiences and, wor and working with uh, self-awareness of body experiences could be a very important arena to work with other stuff that were happening with me, even more psychological uh, issues and how to work them from uh, an embodied perspective. And why is this? <laughs> and from a Buddha quote, we can see that sensations in the body, in a way, are the ground zero, are the place where we direct experience the entire play of life. And just only think on your experience and on your client experience, how much of the time um, there is a felt sense experience, a way of knowing the world, and what it's happening to you that it's related to that felt experience. And the, our embodied presence help us to awaken more from a trance of very mindy uh, way of living. And um, sorry for the noises and <laughs> family around. <laughs> as for most of us um, and uh, how we can relate and pause ourselves and really contact what we care of, what it's really help, happening to us when we directly experience and what help us to directly experience what is happening is our felt sense in a way. The house is very lively, yes. <laughs> this is what happens about doing uh, digital stuff. So this is just to evoking for all of you how you experience your life and how you relate to your emotions and how you relate to your thoughts and when you're ruminating too much, and I'm just I'm gesticulating in this moment, maybe you're like feeling a weight in your body, or there's a felt sense experience that is with that, with your whole psychological uh, experience. And we usually use kind of a uh, the body as for the ones that are more aware with act. So how do you feel this in your body? It's a very common experience in us for act uh, delivery in clinical settings. Um, what I want to explore with all of you today is how can we expand on that, uh, around that and not only asking that experience that question as how are you feeling that in your body as a way of centering and anchoring in the present moment and working with the other act processes around, um, uh, around the body experience, but to do an upgrade around that and think as the body experience as metaphors too. So welcome every, everyone that is coming and I am sorry to speak in English to people that are Spanish speakers that I can see again a lot. So, um, so the question we can ask ourselves while living is, do we live in our body or we just have a body? And this starts, this is a starting point on how are we relating with our, our body experience. 
And many people have the sensation or the feeling or the experience of living from their neck up. And the body is just a vehicle that takes them to one place and the other, or that we have to focus on it as a consuming or an utilitarian thing. We need to get it healthy to be alive, or we need to look good or um, to be loved, or those kind of sensations with uh, those kind of relations with your body. So, in this way, what I invite all of you and invite to start taking into account is how your clients and you relate to your own body. And sometimes it can be a war zone or a unknown zone. <laughs> um, So what I find out in my clinical practice is that many people are very used to being out of touch of their body uh, and they live more often entirely in the mental world. Um, but the fact is that body and mind are interconnected and uh, we may work uh, through our body experience. So some influences uh, that I want to share with you that did inspire the work uh, that I am doing all these years are uh, Utuni, that it's my motherboard in a way, it's how I have been trained in body experience, that it's not well known uh, but it's a body awareness technique uh, related to Alexander technique and Feldenkrais and other kind of those stuff. And that's where I came from. And I, uh, there's a lot of things that if you want to know more around embodied cognitions from more second wave stuff, wave stuff and how we process experience and even very abstract concepts from uh, the embodied experience. And there's a lot of tra trauma work and uh, around working with the body as Pat Argent or Stephen Porges works uh, with polyvagal theory uh, in which you can work with trauma from body experiences. And there's focusing for uh, maybe some of you know that it's a kind of a embodied psychotherapy tech, a way of working developed by Eugene Dendling. But around all those kind of uh, working with and the interconnection of psychotherapy and body experiences, uh, what I um, I started relating uh, because I couldn't find a way that fit functional contextualism perspective and our experience and our perspective with uh, I am looking to my my son that it's making all the noise. Could you please stop? <laughs> okay, so um, all this kind of stuff around working with uh, embodied experiences uh, didn't completely click me click with the way we work in functional contextualism. And there was a book uh, that I read thanks to Nicholas Tarnecke around metaphors we live in that I completely recommended from George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, in which um, they, uh, their thesis is that embodied cognition metaphors, and if you pay attention to your usual language, we are using a lot of uh, 
bodily sensation metaphors. For example, when we, we talk about time, we say we move forward or we'll move backwards. And those are body experience metaphorically used to talk about even very abstract concepts as time. So in this book, they, um, they say that the mind in a way uses the body to make sense of abstract ideas. So in that way, um, they state that sensations can even influence our way of reasoning and our way of relating to the world even in um, abstract terms. Um, so that made me think of how working with this kind of body experiences as metaphors and as vehicles to even um, target psychological flexibility. And for most of you, uh, you may have seen, as Niklas works in metaphor in practice, how many, how useful are metaphors in act for, and it's out of the scope of this workshop, but how we work in act uh, while using metaphors in a way to uh, develop more flexible repertoires around certain issues that the metaphor help us explore. So in that sense, uh, joining all this together, uh, it's a very nice question from Luisa. Thank you for asking. So yes, I do see that having a good uh, body perception, it's, I don't know if it's a prerequisite, that, but it's something we may work on um, even in clinical settings and it will help much more to use this kind of metaphors but the metaphor that i will present for you for for all of you today if you're willing to experiment with it it's a metaphor that i have been working for hundreds and hundreds of people some of you may have experienced that metaphor with me in in in, in a course and uh, if the sensations that I use inside a metaphor, Luisa, are very uh, strong sensations, it's much easier when people don't have a good perception of their body sensations. But at the same time, Luisa, I must uh, say that there's a lot of research saying that people that can discriminate better their sensations are better discriminating their emotions and thoughts and what is happening inside of, of them. And that helps a lot with mental health. So I will totally recommend to everyone here, even if you don't like the metaphors as a way of working with the body in the in sessions, to pay more attention of, on how your clients discriminate your body sensations uh, in general, because it correlates a lot with, uh, with mental health. Uh, you're more able to, to be aware of your internal experience. And as we work in ACT, we want to know our ex uh, internal experience, sensations, thoughts, and emotions, and learn wise ways or flexible ways to relate with them. In, um, so discriminating more what is happening to us, it has to do a lot with discriminating body sensations. Yes, yes, Luisa. And uh, yes, it's much better. And Luisa is asking in the chat uh, that she works a lot with adolescents. So uh, working with more body sensations and body awareness, and I started body awareness technique while being an adolescent and of course I didn't I didn't know what this was <laughs> uh, so um, and and I don't know in other countries but here in Argentina it's 
it's very common that people are more related with their body as a war zone because they are choose elected or um, loved if they look good. So the body thing is more the only awareness that people have around their bodies is their image, but not their internal experience of that. And also, and I can talk about this long, is that uh, proprioception that we think that we have only five senses, but we have uh, seven senses. We have the external senses, eyes, uh, touch, smell, uh, taste, and uh, and uh, with, with which one I uh, I start and he hearing <laughs> that the five senses, but we have two more senses that are proprioception that we can sense what is happening inside our body, and. If you have a stomach ache or if you have internal, if you have your heart uh, pumping and there's a lot of sensations that you're aware that you're there inside your body and there's small receptors all around the body for that sense. And um, so that's interoception, sorry. And there's proprioception that it's a way you can feel your body as a whole and how it is placed in the space in a way and the distances between uh, body parts. So you can sense the distance between your hands and your foot and it's a very elaborated sense. So there's a lot of research uh, also with interoception and how interoception impacts in mental health uh, too. So I completely recommend to work more in interoception with clients. And it can be playful, Louisa, uh, too, if you want to work with that with adolescents. And, um, and it gets less sessions around uh, talking <laughs> and much more on experiences that, as I am going to say in a little while, it's more what we work in act. <laughs> we, uh, our act work, even if it's talking, what we are trying and there's, uh, to work, it's a more experiential way uh, of learning how little kids learn from more direct experience instead of derived learning. So working with the body also helps in that. So it was a long answer to your question. I hope it didn't punish the rest of you to ask questions, but more please ask and let's do this uh, as interactive as we can. So then what with all this um, mixture of things, what I started is to think around uh, and work around with body experiences as a development of uh, awareness that it's a very important process in ACT. And, and, um, and how am I aware of what is happening to me as a pre prerequisite of uh, learning and trying more flexible ways to relate with what is happening with me, that it's the target in ACT. So for a more theoretical point of view and functional contextualism, um, what happens to most uh, talking human beings is that after we learn language or to use language in a way, um, we have been shaped in our society not only to contact our direct experience, but to learn to relate. That is how we learn language. Um, so this means that even the phenomena that we may observe in ourselves, like emotion, thoughts, memory, and physical sensations, can have a var variety of functions that depends on how we arbitrarily relate 
this kind of stuff. So in a way, we lose the innocence as Carmen Luciano uh, states as a metaphor, and we lose the innocence of the world, and we start living in a world that it's more around uh, arbitrarily derived relations that has many, many uh, advantages, but also has many uh, difficulties. Um, so we start giving meaning, not only related to direct experience, but uh, we start giving meaning in a more um, in a more arbitrarily way. And this has to do with RFT that I'm not explaining it, but just stating it in a way. Um, so arbitrarily relations are um, are more influencing and shaping the way we behave and um, and we depart much much more for from what is happening and the wisdom that we can relate from direct experience and when this starts being more complicated we we act on many of self rules that we start creating and we may lose touch uh, that we are acting on self and uncertain self rules that may not be um, and we lose touch with what is happening and the impact of how we are uh, behaving in our direct experience. <coughs> and this acting on a lot of self rules, rules um, may uh, and not being aware that we are acting on those self rules. Uh, and that those self rules are influencing my behavior may help us be trapped in a kind of a vicious circle in an interaction with our, our own responses and our own responses and, um, and lose touch with what the sensitivity to the di more direct contingencies. And that's the definition of inflexibility and psychological inflexibility in a way. So the present moment and becomes more verbally relate and increasingly abstract, derived, remote, and more um, associated with probabilistic consequences. So how do we work with that? And this is where this kind of metaphors um, uh, work are, uh, or get into our work is that um, we can use more direct experience to experiment new responses and new behaviors that don't have to be related with the entanglement that we may have in our minds. So the felt sense can be seen as a context, a context in, in which we may experiment other stuff that in the more mental context are more difficult to experiment. So if we go back to what psychological flexibility is, is about how we interact with our own re respons responses. So how we interact with our own internal experience in a way. And what we do in ACT when we work with psychological flexibility is train ourselves the ability to frame our own responses in a more hierarchical and deictic framing from the invariant I. And that increases the chances that um, our behavior may be, and we broaden our context and the functions that may be present 
and our behavior may be more influenced by, by values. And so the question here, and it's a question of every ACT therapist, is how can we reinforce psychological flexibility? How can we develop? How can we um, uh, create context of learning of more flexible repertoires of relating? And what I want to propose here is that we may reinforce psychological flexibility, learn and reinforce coming, coming back to our own senses. If we try new behaviors in real metaphors, and that it's already, um, there's a lot of research on how working with metaphors, it's a good context or it's a good vehicle to work to um, reinforce more flexible behaviors and how can we, and some of that research from Francisco Ruiz, for, exa for example, uh, they see that when the metaphors use more direct experience uh, in them and they are more evoking with the direct experiences, the metaphors tend to work much better for this purpose. So, a place to try new behaviors, to first notice how am I behaving with what is happening and maybe trying new behaviors could be coming back to our senses and uh, and it has the meta target that it's reinforcing our clients to be more sensitive to contingency, contingencies directly and try out in a more playful way, different ways to, to see what happens. Um, so what we are going to do or what I'm, um, I am uh, inviting you all to, to see as a way is how can we take uh, narrowing repertoire events or places of suffering of our clients and use the body as a vehicle and as a context and as an arena to learn how to behave more flexible in those kinds of things. And if you're still thinking, but how are we going to do this? We are going to see it in a metaphor. So what am I proposing is to use the body experience to change some context in which it is difficult to learn more flexible repertoires. And since, since the body experience is more direct, more flexible in a way, uh, we can transform functions and we can learn new behaviors in there. Um, and it also help us to change the way we are controlling or uh, the, where's the control of our behavior from more verbal, abstract, derived contingencies to more direct ones. And generate some experience that can uh, facilitate variability in repertoire. And we are using metaphors to help also to generalize to other situations. It's not only to contacting to a body experience and develop more variability in responding to that, uh, to, that, um, to that experience. But since we are going to use metaphors that may help us to generalize that learning experience to other uh, context. That's the, the main uh, use of metaphors in a way. So in a way, uh, working with body experience can go in the heart of inflexibility and help us to uh, develop more flexibility. As we usually propose in ACT that is related with experiential work. So we tend to see how we can work in an experiential way 
in, in, in ACT, and there's a discussion happening right now in the list of what do we mean with experiential work. Um, what we usually do in experiential work in ACT is to do different experiences that or concrete activities with the client in order to explore in more in a felt sense uh, what we are working. So the client can learn from their own experience and not from information or from rules that we may be um, giving them. And it also uh, develops the, the possibility of witnessing the experience with curiosity that it's a precursor to more um, sensitivity to contingencies that uh, it's part of psychological flexibility. And um, we did in some way increase the ability to learn from more direct experience discouraging in a way the over reliances on derived verbal learning when it doesn't work. I don't want to put verbal derived learning as the, as the, um, as the enemy. It's just uh, to open uh, the influences in our behavior. And we work with attention to encourage experimenting and uh, in a more functional and analytical way is try out what do you do and what are the consequences and choose uh, from that what really works for you. And we do that with metaphors in particular because uh, as Nicholas uh, says, metaphors can uh, fulfill a pivotal function to carefully observe what we do, how we interact with our own emotions, thoughts, and physical sensations, and the consequences of that interaction. And that will, it's better to affect and do changes. So um, working with metaphors in our clinical work, it uh, can extend our knowledge very quickly. <clears throat> and what we usually do when we work with metaphors is to evoke awareness of situation and try out different possibilities to relate with what is happening and be aware also of the consequence of the, of the consequences and transform possible uh, behaviors. And there's a lot of usual metaphors in ACT that we use. All our ACT books are uh, full of metaphors and there's a even uh, a book, the big book of act metaphors in which I have contributed with one metaphor a long time ago. So let's see how we do an embodied metaphor in a way. How do we experiment uh, with a, a metaphor that I have been talking about, but maybe all of you don't completely realize what am I talking about? So if we stop here, what we have been talking about is how uh, the body experience, it's important in our clinical work, how can it, how it relates to flexible behaviors and, um, and how metaphors of course, also are very important in, in, the, in our clinical work. So not what we are going to see, how these two things merge in a way. And what I'm going to offer to all of you, it's not a talking metaphor in which we highlight only body experiences, that it's the research is more around that, 
but more a felt experience used as a metaphor. It's the other way around. So for the ones that are here, do you want to try? Yes. So we need some assistance for that. What I need you to do is find out an object. It may be a key, a cork, a little stone, or something that you can step in and it won't break. This kind of size. It can be a pen, it could be, hmm, you can't ask me if those kind of things, uh, anything that you can find helps. And since we are all in our houses, uh, we do have things. For example, look what I'm going to use at the orange. <laughs> but if you have little stones or corks or whatever, it's okay. Something that you can step in. Yeah. So what I will ask all of you, the ones that I'm seeing, but there's some people that I am not seeing in an image is to step up and take your shoes off if you have shoes, because, you know, in this Internet uh, uh, days, you never know if you have something that you can't step up because you're not visible from your, <laughs> from your lower part, you may put the camera off if you need it. <laughs> so having the object nearby and just sanding, and the way we are going to do this, it's more as a mindfulness practice. So standing up and Closing your eyes if that feels comfortable for you. Or leaving your gaze soft down. And just opening the awareness to see how do you feel right now? Inviting your awareness into your experience in this moment. And experimenting the difference when your attention is caught up in thoughts, and when you voluntarily direct your attention and intentionally to what is happening right now, what am I aware of in this moment? What are the sensations around my body right now? And without judgment, just only noticing. And taking the time to see how you're experimenting your body right now and what sensations are you aware of. And inviting the attention to feel the contact of the feet on the ground. Nothing has to change about it. Just feeling what is there to feel. Mm.
and how the rest of your body is organized from the contact of the feet to the ground. Noticing what happens with this invitation of being more aware of your body sensations and your felt sense in this moment. Even if you realize that your mind is agitated or calm, that may be felt also in your body experience. Maybe if there is emotional atmosphere around, maybe there's the chance of noticing that by noticing your felt sense, your body sensations in this moment. And now taking the object, I have changed mine to the and put it in the ground near the one of your foot. And slowly stepping your foot on it. And there may be some discomfort associated with it. And it, it's the sensation with we are going to work. So it, if you don't feel any discomfort at all, please put the object in another place uh, down your foot or change the object. But you can choose to put your weight on that foot or on the other, just to take care of yourself. And taking the attention to the, to the discomfort and the contact of the foot with this object. What are your first reactions to this discomfort? Maybe your mind start agitating and giving yourself thoughts. Maybe you can see an, an emotional experience happening inside. Or maybe you're trying to figure it out how to Move your weight in order to minimize that discomfort. And exploring all the sub subtle ways physically that you're doing to control that, to avoid the discomfort that is present in this moment. Maybe you see yourself going to problem solving mind. How does that feel in your body? Taking the time to explore the sensations. and all the battles, the, the ways of fighting, avoiding or hiding 
that you're doing right now, if there are any. And how does that feel in your body? And now taking your attention to the place of contact of that object on your foot. Recognizing the place of contact, where they are and how they feel that it's different of thinking of them. It's just going to the direct experience of that object in contact with your foot. And letting your foot be transformed by this object. Maybe you are aware of some tension around it. And how is to relax, soften the contact between the foot and the object? And seeing, noticing what happens moment by moment. And maybe your foot is transforming, it's opening a little bit to the presence of this object. How is that possibility? How does it feel to let that object be as it is? Not, not as your mind tells you it is. Just exploring with curiosity how you are knowing that object and that sensations that this object evoke by really feeling it with curiosity from your foot. and investigating the small sensations and subtleties, maybe a tingling, a vibrating. Maybe the discomfort comes and goes. And exploring this possibility of, of letting it be just there. And feeling it just as it is. And now slowly taking your foot and moving it to the side. 
and feeling how does that food feels after experimenting what we have experimented and how all that side of the body feels And how does the other foot feel on the other side of the body? Do you feel a difference between one of the, and the other? And you don't need to overthink it, just feeling it. And now, what have you learn from this experience of relating with this object and the discomfort of this object. And If this small discomfort under your foot is as any other discomforts in your life. Like emotional pain or distress or some discomforts in your life. What have you learned from your felt experience about relating with this discomfort of the object that you could try in other discomforts in your life? And slowly going back and sitting down, opening your eyes and moving. Hmm. Hmm. And we will take some time, some time to hear comments around what did happen with this experience for you? What have you learned? What have you experiment? And the unbooking of the experience of this kind of things is as much of the work as the body experience, uh, experience itself. So, and if, yes, Luisa, you can speak in the language that you want to speak. <laughs> I can speak English, thank you. Great. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody, I'm from Brazil. And for me, I felt some different things. I felt my mind telling me, no, you're not feeling anything. You're strong enough to deal with that. And it's something that I can see that I always do when I have problems or when I feel that I'm going through hardship of some kind. And when you ask us to try to, like, don't fight the existence of the object, I was using a rubber, I could really feel like my foot adapting to it. Oh. So, like, really, like, embracing it somehow. Yes. And it was, it made it easier. And I also realized how I felt it all over my body. And it made me remember to, whenever I'm feeling something, some discomfort that sometimes when I feel the pain, it's not exactly the source of it. So it's yes. something for me to remember. So these are some parts of the experience I live with a bit. A lot, Luisa, and very interesting because this kind of felt experience of embracing the object 
you can evoke it too when you have uh, a discomfort in your life, not, not only a physical pain, but how would it be to relate with this discomfort in that way? And it's less cognitive in a way. It's like, oh, well, because we are talking about acceptance, you know? <laughs> it's less around, oh, I have to accept this, blah, blah, blah. But it's a more felt experience of what acceptance really feels. Hmm. Thank you, Luisa, for sharing that feels for you <laughs> it may feel different from others yes someone else that want to share about the experience maybe i will read uh, uh, the chat okay so uh, martin uh, writes that there was something missing after removing the food from the object <laughs> I feel like adapted to that pain after a while. Exactly, Marcin. And you can see that when we relate to our pain in different ways and we let ourselves to transform, it, it comes as being a part of life. We integrate our pain in a way and we don't need to take it off it may be, become part of it. So it's interesting how that felt experience of, oh, I have integrated that object and even the pain of part of my experience. Mm. Thank you. And Diana wrote, I felt all the avoidance, moving around, focusing on the rain outside and thought, that these same strategies I use on other occasions as well. Very interesting that you notice those kind of strategies and how do they work for you on those places and in this metaphor and how it may work to just, as Lisa said, embrace it, give it a space, let it be as we work on the metaphor in, in a way. Hmm? Thank you, Diana. Hi, Monica. <laughs> uh, thank you. If someone else want to write on chat or open the mic uh, to, to share something, it is welcome. Hmm. Okay, so now you felt what a metaphor, an embodied metaphor is in a way, or what I was talking about is this kind of felt experience. And in this particular metaphor, we work around acceptance, but in a less analytical way and in a more felt sense way. And we did work inside with the fusion too if you paid attention and what's the difference between thinking about what is happening and just being with what you're feeling in a way. So this kind of experiences are a way of experimenting the act processes, the way of uh, evoking learning, uh, to relate with experience in a more psychological, flexible way, but in a more grounded on the senses uh, place. And this particular metaphor, the script of the metaphor, if someone wants to use it, it's uploaded on the ACBS website. Um, and there is um, there's a sub page uh, with um, with um, embodied metaphors, and one of the scripts is this one, and there's a lot of other scripts that I have developed that are there. 
how much acceptance do we do before doing the things we can to stop the pain when that choice is available to us? For instance, I had a project on felt immense anxiety in my job, but two, three weeks with all the emotions, thinking well, if they are there, what they are. Yes, Diana, there's no uh, rule for what you're asking. It depends on your context and what works for you. So there, this is something we can also work with this kind of metaphor because there was a way to control discomfort too. You can put your weight on the other feet, foot and uh, lessen the discomfort. There was choice around that. And what I do with some clients, Diana, that ask the same question of you, just try it out, how it works. And what I usually get, if they're all the time trying to um, control the level of pain or discomfort, uh, it, it gets tense in the body and it, makes it hard to live in a way. And when they did this, I can choose to lessen a little bit the discomfort, but then I can try the other. It's a dialectic in a way. I can try the other. Uh, there was more freedom to relate what is happening. But you have to experiment it. Yes, it is a balance. Yes, thank you. But it's interesting how we can answer these questions, as I did with Diana, with the direct experience instead of thinking about it. If I had a client that asked the same of Diana, I would have put it again with the object and experimented and let the answer come comes from their own experience. Uh, and that is what it's all about, what we are working in ACT. Let the answers come from our own experiences. That, that's the easy way to talk about sensitivity to contingencies. <laughs> uh, so that is what we are working, yes. So this kind of metaphors as the one we did may help us as Luisa shared or Marcin shared to look at the answers in this experience and feel empowered. I can learn, I did this here, so I can do it somewhere else. And I will try it out and even uh, enable more curiosity. Oh, how would it be, as Diana said, to work the same with my anxiety when I feel the discomfort? Let's try it out. And that is also what we want to do in ACT, have people trying out <laughs> and not uh, self-reliant on the rules. If I try it out, it will help. Or if I do that, it will happen that. Go and try it out. <laughs> yes, so that it's also another um, good secondary effect of this kind of metaphors. <laughs> In, in spite of the, of, the, of the target of the metaphor. So the metaphor we experiment, experimented was a metaphor about dealing with pain and how we can broaden our repertoire around dealing with pain and discomfort, but not only physical pain, but emotional pain, psychological pain, and we use the metaphor to relate that. Um, and what we have done is to open the door with the metaphor to the several variations that may arise in the situation that when the mind says there's none variations. Uh, and we did work on enacing more flexible repertoires, in this case, uh, relating with pain. And we work in a felt sense of acceptance and diffusion and present moment uh, attention and more even as a self, as a context uh, place. 
this is how metaphors work. Um, we use the metaphor, and in this case, we use the body experience of the discomfort as a relational ne network, as a vehicle. And from there, we uh, coordinated uh, if this discomfort is the same as other discomforts in your life. And we can target with clients after the metaphor their own discomfort and go back and forth with the felt experience and the target experience uh, shaping their repertoire in a more direct way with the body experience. So, how do we do this? And I hope this makes curiosity for you to develop some of this. Um, we, um, we need to offer an experience that uh, impacts and can be um, inside the felt landscape, uh, guided in the here and now. What do you feel in this moment as we did? interwoven the target as the, and the vehicle while guiding. If you are with a client as I have been, that we know the discomfort, I may name that this specific discomfort inside the guiding of the metaphor to augment the, the, the relations that may happen between the two relational networks. Uh, and specifically augment the share functions between the target and the vehicle and the functions that we want to um, highlight about new learning ways of relating with this. And this happens inside the metaphor and after, as I did with some of you, uh, talking about the experience help us to highlight the functions that we, we want to highlight. And evoke awareness by using noticing and description and also tracking, like what do you notice? How do you relate? What consequence does it have? That it's this sensi sensitivity to contingencies that we want generally to work. And we need to also give room, as we did with Lisa, Luisa and some of you, to let the client derive and explore the relational relations and the relational networks that may arise with them. And what we usually do is when I put this kind of metaphors in the consulting room is choose an, a specific, and I do create the metaphors in Bebo because I am very, uh, um, very used to them, but you can use scripts as we use in ACT. Of course, they are much better if we create it with the clients. And we choose a specific aspect of the client uh, situation and, and we think about this functionally. For example, if there's a client with a lot of emotional pain, we can choose this metaphor because we think functionally that we want to work with other ways to relate with their pain. And the metaphor target must be the phenomenon that has an important function with the client. In this case was the discomfort. And the metaphor vehicle must correspond to essential features of its target. In this case, the discomfort, the avoidance from the discomfort, the thoughts around it, those kind of things, the way of trying to deal with the pain and uh, and choose this appropriated vehicle to represent an alternative perspective on the client situation. And this is how we embrace the object. And we did it here, how we embrace the object, how can we be with it? The closer the vehicle match matches the target relationally, the better the metaphor will work. So as Lisa generally, generously 
share with us this embracing. It's a good metaphor for acceptance in a way. So she did say it and it did match and it was inside a metaphor to evoke it. So it's also important to immerse the client in the felt sense of experience and continue to study particularly subtle aspects of it to be more uh, a complex network and to uh, evoke more complexity. So conclusions for and the ending and discussion for today. This kind of metaphor provide a number of possibility that can be used appropriated for different clients. And uh, they can help us, for example, in this to respond in difficult emotional context. Physical sensations are a privileged uh, vehicle and we can use this uh, kind of practices to instigate model and support psychological, psychological flexibility, um, helping us be more aware, open, someone is drawing, <laughs> it's not me, being aware, open and actively engage, uh, helping that with inside a felt sense metaphor. And while doing this kind of embodied metaphors, the behaviors may be generalized uh, without getting people thinking too much on it. So here it's the end of my part, but I want to open to questions and reactions and whatever I may you all be willing to open. Does Monica? <laughs> no, you just oh. wanted to put a reaction or your <laughs> No, no. <laughs> no, I want to ask you something, Manu. Yes, yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, happy to see you. <laughs> me too. Very happy to see you. You know, I was trying to find the resources you said that we could find uh, at uh, the page and I, I can't see it. Okay, I, I, what I would do is to post now the, the, the um, it's opening another page, sorry. Uh, I will put the link here to the specific um, Please. Uh, scripts, but if you ever want a script, Monica, you can, you know where to find me. It's in That's resources. True and then uh, clinical resources uh, part and there's uh, metaphors and and there it's the embodied metaphors what it is <laughs> um, yeah I, I i will send you the link i i am well, you know okay, thank you so much yes I'm, i really want to have them thank you yes yes <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they have more around the stuff. Well, I will find it out where they are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, someone else wants a question or something? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Yes, uh, Bartos. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a long one, but um, well, just uh, I, I had some thoughts uh, um, because uh, you mentioned uh, the, the opposition between verbal contingencies and uh, like direct contact with experience and this yes. is a very skinnerian distinction but also yes. maybe embraced in a body-based tradition so i wonder to which extent is it like a practical distinction and to which an actual distinction so for example like do you think there is a behavior that could be considered as like opposite to verbal in humans or maybe no. there could be, I, I, yeah. It's a, for me, it's a practical distinction because I think as uh, uh, the Barn Holmes state that when we are verbal, everything is verbal <laughs> uh, in a way. So it's more like a practical distinction that, uh, yeah, yeah, that a true distinction in a way. Mm. Right, because, you know, it's like, you can have a behavior that is like more verbally controlled and yes. it can, it can be more sensitive to the current context than, than some other. 
Yes, exactly. It's more around that, that it's a verbal behavior, that it's more sensitive to more direct contingencies. But I do think that direct contingencies at all don't exist completely when we are verbal, because it's impossible that we don't relate our experience in a more arbitrarily way. And so it is verbal behavior all around. But I think this is, this is a big discussion even inside ACBS, isn't it? Uh, there are some people that do use the distinction that's true, and there's other people that don't use that distinction between behavior as, as true. And maybe would, do you find any other interesting distinction between the body-based traditions, like I have no knowledge of these, and uh, uh, what we assume within CBS? Um, well, the first distinction is this, that even in the body uh, traditions, they do that distinction. And in CBS, we don't. We think that it's all verbal in a way. And um, there's a more mechanistic uh, place in the, in the body traditions, usually, um, in which there's something like in psychosomatic stuff it's like mental things uh impacting body or body impacting mental but those kind of correlations are more modeled in a more mechanistic uh philosophy way and i think what i want to do and we do in cbs with the body experience but we want to do in cbs is how to approach this kind of stuff but from a more con uh, functional contextualism way instead of a more subtle mechanic mechanistic way. I don't know if that was the line of your question. Sure, thank you. <laughs> there's a whole range of things around more psychosomatic stuff in which there's a, there's a, that I, I personally don't agree because that kind of a mechanistic approach in which uh, it is your psychological state that mechanically is the cause of some symptoms in your body or vice versa, uh, that I don't really think that is complete, completely congruent with a more CBS approach. But I don't know if I'm the only one that I'm interested in this kind of stuff, or maybe some of the people in the audience are too, <laughs> right? <laughs> I have been going around the embodied tradition for a long, long, long time. Uh, so uh, I think we need more development of this more embodied uh, interventions in act uh, coherent with CBS approach. So um, I hope that many of the people in the audience getting inspired in doing more other kind of stuff. Uh, Graciela Rovner is doing a lot of, ta of stuff, Mar Martin Alverse too, and there are other people around CBS world, but we are really few. <laughs> so and we need more research around this stuff and really developing more embodied um, interventions in our work and see how they, they, they function there. Hmm. Thank you, Bartos, for that question. It gave me the possibility to share this, this that it's really valuable. Hmm. There are currently no more uh, questions, I think. Yes, yes, exactly. There's a comment by Monica saying that she, I know Paulo and Alan are very interested in that. Yes, let's grow the interest, Monica. <laughs> We don't. It's it's funny that we are from South America, the ones and in a more body, body embodied cultures, and I think this is a whole other topic to discuss in more embodied culture, more interested in this kind of approach. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. So uh, I guess there are no more uh, questions or remarks. So thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you, Bartos. Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending and being here. And I hope you tried out more embodied stuff in your clinical work or maybe pay more attention to this in your clinical work. And see you all uh, soon, I hope. <laughs>